Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is very exciting to be here today. Uh, my name is Norma Cram, and I'm the Vice President and Chair of the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Practice at Van Squick Associates. The topic of the impacts of cybercrime and socioeconomic impacts is really an important one. And at the same time that we're sitting here talking about these issues today, we are surrounded here at Davos with discussions about the benefits of digital innovation and digital transformation. But at the same time, every day we're seeing increasingly ransomware attacks on our small communities, on our hospitals, companies big and small. And the issue ultimately for all of us is to understand how do we manage and address these issues? How do we change the paradigm within other companies and public sector entities to address the risk? And if you understand what the risk is, I think there can be better mitigation tools. We have an amazing panel that's here today, and we're going to talk a little bit about four main issues, and then I'm going to introduce our panelists. As we think about crime overall and cybersecurity attacks, we need people to understand what, who the attackers are and what do they want. We have nation states, we have non-state actors, and they're looking to do really three things. Steal, disrupt, or destroy. <coughs> Ultimately, there are great impacts on what we call critical infrastructure, essential services, national critical functions, but we need to find ways to better address them in these issues. So, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then I'm going to give them four or five main questions, and then we'll take a few questions from the audience. So we have Denise Anderson who is the president of the Healthcare ISAC and the chairwoman of the National Council of ISACs. Next to her, we have Hans Wilhelm, the president of Cyber Security Council in Germany. I did okay there, yeah. We have Richard Rushing, who's the CISCO of Motorola Mobility. And we have Pavan Dugal, who's the advocate Supreme Court of India and director Pavan Dugal. So we have an exciting panel. So we're going to talk first uh, about one of my favorite issues and one that's exceptionally challenging, and that's the issue around attribution. We have the same nation state, non-state actors who are continually hacking into our system. Sometimes it's simply like North Korea and others to raise money. But trying to go after those attackers is very hard and bring them to justice. And so we have what I call the repeat offenders. So when we think about attribution overall, what is it that we could all be doing better? How can we help, I think, our companies and public sector, sector entities understand who some of these attackers are and then how to manage that risk? I'll just open that up to the panel. Huh? Yes, attribution. It's a very sexy world, word in the last congresses in Germany and so on. And, um, but I think we have to explain attribution. A lot of people talk about attribution, but we don't know what it is. And I think um, the challenge is to understand who is the guy behind the machine. <coughs> because it's a question of responsibility and liability. But if we be honest, we have no attribution at the moment. Because it's a technical challenge, it's a question of international law, and it's not so easy if you occupy a Bayer Monsanto network or a German defense distributor. Um, do you want to destroy the IT infrastructure there? And I think that is not the normal field of crime we have, that we have a broken window or something like that, and then we have forensic um, uh, support or something like that. And I think we need more platforms for that together with the law enforcement, and sorry, in Germany we have 16 states with their own law enforcement. For example, in Germany, in Berlin, you have one police from the police, one officer, who is responsible for the topic. And then you can go to our hospital concerns, to the big hospitals in Germany, or you go to the um, critical infrastructure sectors, and you speak with the CIOs, and you can ask them, hey, what is the support from the police? And they say, hey, we have no support. And I think it's a challenge for the public-private partnership sector because it's um, a question of information exchange and we need it in real time. Normally, in Germany, the backbone of the German industry are the small, medium-sized companies. Round about, you need around about 218 days to understand that you have an infiltration. And I think that is a, is a big challenge. And um, if you see, if you have a, a total failure in a small, medium-sized company in Germany, 
for example, a big supplier for the German Volkswagen. Then you have, after a total failure, you have, after two days, uh, the first uh, liquidity uh, problem. And then it's, the game is over. So it is very hard, and we have the same issue for small and medium-sized businesses, too. So anyone else want to talk a little bit about attribution and then... Yeah, I, I think it's a couple of different areas. The attribution is extremely difficult. A lot of times, and we try to precursor that to the, the physical crime side of someone throwing a brick through the window. Well, do I have a witness? Do I have a CCTV camera that recorded the issue? Do I have an alarm that went off? Do I know the time of the issue? In the world of cyber, we may not have any of that. We just know that something, someone had a mail message, clicked on a link, and now everything's locked up in a ransomware function. Now, that being said, the issues that you have with the smaller companies and organizations, they don't have the technical talent, nor the resources, nor even the funding to go out and get some of this, these capabilities from a, a personal perspective, but also from a, 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 a function outside of, <laughs> of just going out and getting a uh, expert to come in and do something. They're really difficult around it, and that's the only way the attribution is going to come to place. And I think uh, the public-private partnerships, a, there's a, a juncture point between it that there is kind of a seesaw. When it becomes big enough that we need to release information, we'll release information right. Right. out to the rest of the world to protect themselves. And we see this with vulnerabilities and other things that once it gets to that critical tipping point, we'll get out. And I think that's one of the key areas is that has to be early on and almost in real time to go back out there and see it. And you see it with the pickup from uh, the MITRE ATT&CK framework. People are interested in how they are doing things to the organizations because that's a lot of times around the attribution right. paces of that. And I think that helps everyone in, in, the, in the economic stat from the largest of the organizations to the small companies. If I have that visibility or the same capability as a large company, I should be able to know what's actually going on. Right. Big and small, though, have the same problem. So, Pavan, quick question. I want, to, I want to expand the debate. This is all talking about attribution in the superficial net. Attribution on the dark net is a complete no man's land. Today, none of the law enforcement agencies across the world have the wherewithal to try to identify the actual identity of people who are anonymous on the, the Tor network. And that's something that very quickly we'll have to start working on. Yes, you can, as a law enforcement agency, try to permeate, try to be a part of them, then use social uh, uh, monitoring tactics. That's good enough. But over a period of time, a holistic approach will have to be done. How do we attribute that this anonymous handle, which went ahead and, say, attacked the 600 computers this morning, uh, on uh, the Virginia public library has to be identified. Now, though that's something that uh, most of the people don't yet begin talking about. Right. And that's important that we should go forward. I think that's a good point. And Denise, I know that you have spent many, many years <laughs> attempting to share what we call actionable and timely information, helping, again, big and small. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I was just going to mention, too, what attribution does. It actually gives you a couple things. One, it helps you understand motivation, because if you understand who's coming after you, you can help and then activity within, you know, what you can expect from the attacker. But second of all, it also allows um, the attacker to get the message that you can't operate with impunity. Um, and we've seen some um, reasonable consequences from law enforcement actions recently where they came out and, and did attribution with the Iranian actors for Sam Sam ransomware, and we saw that dry up completely. And they were attacking heavily hospitals and local governments, and that, that went away. Uh, we saw that certainly with the Carbonat Group um, in finance and banking, where they were, um, when that was taken down, we saw um, that go away. Of course, sometimes it's black and mole, and they'll come up in another way, but it does help stop some of that. And it also gives, again, that message that you, you can't operate um, without impunity, um, because if we just let them go, and, and I could get on a lot worse on that one too, but if you let them go, um, you know, they, they'll just continue. Right. And that, I think that's one of the biggest challenges for people when we talk about the economic impacts and cybercrime overall, right? The attackers are using, maybe they're attacking some, a specific target, maybe they're just using a wide net. 
and we saw that in Petnia and not Petya. Uh, and one of the other issues that really brings to mind that attack is having a broader conversation with all companies and the tech community, which is talking about what I call end of life, right? End of life support for software or hardware. How do we mark? How do we share information? And, which is one topic, and I think we're starting to see a lot more of that. But what do we do with companies and entities who continue to operate systems where it's been clearly discussed that there will be no more service, right? We, you know, there's a target on their backs and there's a huge hole. How do we deal with that? You see it, for example, uh, two weeks ago or a week ago when Windows 7 went away. Exactly. Uh, Windows 2008 went away. Organizations still use it. It's into life. And you have articles telling how Microsoft is making 400 million people buy new OSs. Is it a money grab? And, and it's actually, there is a legacy of support that you can only go so far with these things and there's that. In the world of critical controls and things like that, some of these are, we went with the, the organizations where systems were designed to operate 20 or 30 years in, in those end of life. Now the question is, things are designed to operate in 20, 30 months. And the idea of software or retrofit, it was, hey, we flash it, oh, it's a $5 part. You know what, you replace it until you figure out that it's on top of a light pole and each replacement is gonna be $2,000. You're gonna have cities that are gonna be like, uh, no, we're not gonna replace it in two years. It's the, the economic feasibility of it is just not there. So there is lots of dividing lines that come into play and I think it's one of the key areas that from both the awareness standpoint of when you're looking at these things, end of life should be a focus and a lot of times it's not. We just deploy it and it's someone else's problem in the afterworld. Right. We're having a conversation in the US and in the EU about actual marking, again, both of devices, hardware and software, so consumers can actually understand what that it is. Um, I think some people around the world fear that that will be a mandate, uh, but I think there needs to be a broader conversation on, on what do we do. Uh, the SOP underbelly, which is a lot of our public sector entities, cities, municipalities, even <coughs> airports, transportation, we talk a lot about health, is trying to change the awareness that they have to take action. You can't keep using the same system over and over and then add technology on top of it. Yeah. Although it's difficult because, you know, an MRI machine is not something you're going to go out and replace, you know, every two years, uh, to your point. Earlier, in many of the other critical infrastructure, like all the manufacturing um, plants and processes that are in place. So it's a very thorny issue, and I think one we probably need to grapple as a society, um, you know, how do we balance the need to advance technology, but also the realities of cost and replacement of, of technology? So I think um, that that's something that we really need to look at, at, um, at as a whole. Anyone else on that? No, I, I, you, you bring up a, a really good point. If you look back characteristically, there was time when the first-ish APT instances came into play that were all about IE6 and why it was on someone's network just because they needed access to an application that only supported and only used IE6. And I think this is one of the telltale signs. It's not just as a hardware component of this. There are software components in the life too that even though they've been upgraded, there's reasons that they're still leveraged and used today uh, in um, almost any of the critical infrastructure as well as some of the others that, hey, we're using this three-year-old application because it has to be used in this format or no longer supported. Uh -huh. But I think we need a basement to control our systems. I think we have the problem that we don't understand and that we don't control our systems. And I think we need security laboratories in Bonn, in New York, in Washington, in Singapore, in Moscow, and so on. And then they check the soft and hardware. Oh, no, okay, I know, next day we have a new update, that is a problem, but I think it's also a question for the producers of soft and hardware. And um, they have a liability and responsibility. And I think we need something like a certificate that we say, hey, we checked your product and you can buy it. 
You are a small, medium-sized, family-oriented company in Germany. You can buy it. And um, I, I think we need this framework and this um, environment in the smart plan, not only in Germany or in the European Union. And um, I think that is a question of a cooperation between all the national authorities. Perhaps we need a European platform for that, together with the science sector, together with the industry. But look at Germany. We have a 5G discussion. Yeah? The main supplier of the German telecom is Huawei. Stop. We could talk about that yeah. for hours. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> no, but <laughs> yeah, but that is a, a topic. No, it's, it is a topic. And we have to change. And I, I want to connect one piece, and then I want to go into a, a different issue area. When we talk about that connection, though, so we all we all pick up five G or uh, Huawei, yeah. Um, but we do have a whole conversation about smart cities, smart communities. Right? It is sexy to connect everything. Uh, and I think the level of awareness of those who want to connect it and the communities who are offering the connection, a lot of time it's really for the data that can be collected and then monetized. We're having the same conversation now where everyone is, has this rush to connectivity. And that is a systemic risk. You know, as you look at both your sectors that you're dealing with and overall, what is it that we can be doing to help, I think, better educate and address some of these issues? Can I say that we should begin yeah. with the Internet of Things as a starting point? Because still now our discussions is based on use of just computers, computer systems, computer networks, and communication devices. But once you talk about these smart devices, when there is no international protocols on agreed standards of cyber security on the Internet of Things, we already have a challenge at hand. Yes, California has begun well by coming up with this new law from 1st of January 2020, which mandates all manufacturers of smart devices in, uh, in California to put in place reasonable security features. UK is falling suit, but then that's, those are early movers. The fact still remains, you will have to come up with legal frameworks of what kind of minimum security standards you want to put for your smart devices. Otherwise, your smart TVs are going to rip you off and your personal conversations and your personal moments for a long, long period of time. Now, you bring up an interesting point around the technology and, 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 and the laws that are created around it are always the second after the, the afterthought that occurs. It's not that it's already occurring. It's already the cat's out of the bag, the, the genie's out of the bottle. We're already into this problem uh, that we're associated with. And th there's also a, a big pushback in the world of, hey, we, this is hard and we can't do it. I'm like, we've already did it with computers. We're not following a different framework or something else that is completely unique. It's the same core tenants that are for everything that's just moved over to a different type of device, which will move again to another different type of device that's there. Um, and they have the foundations of being better than what we're dealing with in the computer environments in a lot of cases. Right. Let me say this, and it's what will tee up, uh, I'm sure, a response and a reaction from everyone. The concept that we're, we, we, the royal we, are not creating laws until after the fact, you know, the juxtaposition is the private sector doesn't want new laws, um, sometimes for good, sometimes for, you know, other reasons, and then there's an incident and there's always, a, I don't care what country you're in, there's a rush to pass a law that will ban whatever behavior, right? So we are starting to see new cybersecurity laws, uh, IoT laws, data localization, right? It's, a, it's the messy middle. So, you know, what do we think of the messy middle right now? Where are the challenges that we need to keep an eye on? Uh, what do we need to do in the leadership around the world to make sure we have responsible cybersecurity laws? As of now, the world is completely uh, seeing a vacuum. There's absence of an international law or a legal framework on cybersecurity. The, the best that you can think of is the Budapest Convention, but that convention of 2001 is roughly 20 years old and has uh, only a limited mandate for regulating cybersecurity. So at the on cyber crime. So therefore, uh, very quickly you have to come up with the international legal principles. 2015, I had mooted the idea of the need for an international convention on cyber law and cyber security. Countries did not bite the bullet, logically so, because uh, each country is doing covert and not overt kind of activities and cyberspace. Nobody wants to be named and shaped. But having said that, very quickly, common minimum denominators of cyber security will have to start coming in. Otherwise, the current approach will not just be effective. What is the current approach? Different countries are saying, hey guys, 
No international cyber law? No problem. I'm coming up with my national laws on cyber security. Come countries like China, and they say my cyber security is part of my national security, and that applies to the entire world, to outer space, to deep sea bear bed, and to the Arctic and the Antarctic. Now, with these kind of very broad national cyber security laws, you are actually going in a dangerous direction. On top of it, you have a country like Vietnam, which has now come up with a new cyber security law, which has come up with a unique concept. The concept of a national cyberspace. Hold on. I thought cyberspace was a common heritage for humanity. But they say no, the entire internet is my national cyberspace and is going to be governed by my national law. Of course, you have uh, more nuances and variations in the Singapore approach, but by and large, uh, cyber security breaches are a global problem, a multi uh, national problem, and cannot be dealt with uh, national laws per se. So, very quickly, legal frameworks will have to come across. It's only a question of time when it's going to come across. At the International Commission on Cybersecurity Law, we are collating common legal principles which could at least be a starting point for discussions. We are saying, look, as a country, feel free to pick and choose from the a la carte menu, but at least start making the choice. Don't say, look, I don't have any menu, I don't have any buffet, I'm okay. not eating. That's not what is happening. Well, when we think about basic tenets, though, right? Sure. Implementing basic tenets, having some commonality. I know we have a panel uh, this afternoon that we'll get into. What is, what's a normal cybersecurity attack and what's an act of war? Right? That's a line that's interesting to draw. But I was going to jump in with a little test of reality. I mean, I understand the whole <laughs> conversation, and actually, I, I, you know, I talked about impunity and, and operating with impunity, but the reality is, is that the cyber cr criminals don't care about laws, right? They're in the business to make money, and they're going to go after whatever they need to do. So bringing it back to the whole social economic uh, consequences of cyber crime, um, I think you know it's it's really important that um, people are aware that. There are attackers out there, and they're going to come get you if you don't have, um, you know, even if you do have good cybersecurity practices in place. So basically, the focus should really be on resilience, um, operational resilience, and risk um, appetite, and trying to understand how you can operate within that environment. One, what, what, we're going to go to one last topic, and then quickly into questions. <laughs> the, the topic of cyber workforce is something we've already talked about, but the bigger issue is in trying to educate companies and entities about their cyber risk. They're a victim of ransomware, they're a victim of a cybersecurity attack, and they don't even have the people internally to manage that incident at that point. So as you're working with your respective organizations, so this is not a pie in the sky, what is it that you're doing to try and help people manage their own risk now? I think it's all about capacity building. You have to start sensitizing these guys that look, please wake up from your slumber. And gals. Guys and gals. Gals. Yes. gals and gals. Yeah. Second thing, you have to quickly start understanding that this slip service has to stop. This slip service of just saying, look, we are doing cyber security. This law says, let's look at what Australia is doing. Now we have to start learning from our mistakes. Australia says, look, you start using encryption in my country, please give me the backend keys, otherwise it becomes an offense. Right. Now, those kind of things have to be studiously avoided. No, I, I agree. But I think, maybe Denise, I'm going to pick on you a little bit in a good way, which is you, you represent a diverse industry that loves digital transformation. But how are they, I mean, are they waiting, they deal with the attack and then quickly try and address their workforce shortage? I mean, it's this is a short-term issue on top of the long-term one. So I think, you know, basically one of the things obviously is education and getting people to understand why it's important for them to create um, that cybersecurity awareness within their operation. So, and obviously you have a 20 bed hospital that's not hard, that's not an easy thing to do. You've got the janitors probably, your IT security professional <laughs> and your IT administrator. Um, so, I mean, that that's kind of, um, that's obviously something that's, that's a huge issue that it doesn't scale in many ways. But if you're aware of the particular things that could potentially happen to you and have practices in place that can help you be resilient, really in healthcare specifically, it's become a patient safety issue. If, you, if your hospital shut down due to ransomware, you have to turn away patients then that's absolutely a problem. You you could it'll take it's just a matter of time before someone dies 
or it has serious health consequences because of a cyber incident. And you know, when that happens, of course, we'll see all the laws get passed and all the uproar around it. But um, the fact is, people wait until it's too late, and we need to be building that ahead. Right. Well, let me let me do this. We're, we, I think we've been given the highest time. We have maybe five minutes left. So let's go to questions, uh, and then we'll do a quick roundup. So just it tells your name, uh, your organization, and then your question. David Stenner, the Chief Security Officer for the Bank. Um, is there any evidence whatsoever that laws related specifically to cybercrime have any effect at all? And we already have laws against stealing, right? So right. if they stole it by, like for example, my customers don't care if someone stole it because they walked in and stole it out of the branch, or because they did some technical attack and took the money out of their account. Yeah. What? Do the new laws help at all? I have the feeling that the cyber criminals are not interested in our uh, organigrams. Yes, that is a big problem. And I think the biggest problem is that um, we have a lot of, sorry, techie discussions, yes, and conferences, but a normal European small, medium sized company. They have no IT administration and they have no people who are responsible for IT security. And I think we have to reach the decision makers, the management level, the board of directors, the supervisory board. We need a special function because cybersecurity is a central process and business enabler. And that is not the reality. Right. Well. But let me just say this. I mean, we're having, and I think we will till the end of time, having the conversation about the need for governance, leadership at the top. But I think your, your point, the only thing I see on the cyber crime laws is assigning both victim and attacker, right? But assigning more responsibility on the victim for what is what is responsible security, what should you have been doing, what didn't you do? We've already talked about the issue of attribution. Getting the attacker is a lot harder. And Very what happens quickly. when artificial intelligence starts doing cybercrime? Because that's already started doing. <laughs> who am I going to catch up? Is it the coder? Is it the person who uses this? So actual world laws on crime may not necessarily be directly replicable in the context of these new emerging avatars of cyber crimes. And therefore, I think there's a need for a new mindset, a new uh, legislative approach on this I, I, We're getting a high sign here, but, so let me just say this. I think one of the things that is important is actually focusing on the outcome, right? We have a huge impact on our national economic security because of cybersecurity issues. We still, unfortunately, have sectors that are not quite where they need to be. We could talk about supply chain for forever. What do we do with small, medium-sized businesses? And again, how do we go get the attackers, I think, is very challenging. But I think we have the right people in the room to keep having this conversation uh, and hopefully, hopefully making an impact. So I want to thank our panel. Uh, you can give them all a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Each one of you has been very you know, interesting conversation in the sense that overall, I think we have an eye on cyber law, but it's not moving as much. But I think we are we have to define where we go next, right? So excellent job. Thank you.